Good evening, visitors. Welcome to the Australian War Memorial's last post ceremony. My name is Troy Clayton, and joining us today from the Royal Australian Navy is Commodore Michelle Miller. This evening, we commemorate the 79th anniversary of the loss of the Australian light cruiser HMAS Perth and more than 350 members of her crew in the Battle of the Sunda Strait on this date in 1942. The bell that you have just heard being struck was recovered in 1975 from the wreckage of the HMAS Perth I. On the 28th of February, HMAS Perth and the heavy cruiser USS Houston were making for the southern coast of Java. Late that evening, they encountered the Japanese Western Invasion Convoy at the northern entrance to the Sunda Strait. The convoy was escorted by a large Japanese flotilla of two light cruisers, eight destroyers and a mine lighter, supported by another four cruisers, an aircraft carrier and further destroyers. Heavily outnumbered, soon running low on ammunition and changing course constantly to avoid attacks from every direction, the Australian and American crews fought desperately against impossible odds. Together, Perth and Houston succeeded in sinking a Japanese transport and a mine layer, and they severely damaged a further three transports. But under the weight of Japanese numbers and superior firepower, the end was inevitable. Japanese ships launched 85 torpedoes during the brief engagement. Perth suffered her first hit from a Japanese shell at 11.26 p.m. Soon after midnight, the first torpedo struck. With her crew reduced to firing practice shells and illumination star shells, when a second torpedo hit Perth shortly afterwards, her captain ordered abandoned ship. Perth was hit by two more torpedoes before finally sinking at 25 minutes after midnight on the 1st of March. The action was all over in just under an hour from the time the first round struck. Houston, meanwhile, continued to fight, although ablaze from enemy fire. She was rent by shell and torpedo explosions and sank just 20 minutes later. The captains of both vessels perished with their ships. Of the complement of 686 men in HMAS Perth, more than half, over 350 officers and ratings, perished in this, her last action. Of the 320 survivors captured by the Japanese, one third died during their long ordeal as prisoners of war. Of the more than 1,000 American officers and men in US, USS Houston, less than 400 escaped in their sinking ship. Only 266 of them survived the harsh regime of brutality and starvation in Japanese prisoner of war camps. Australian sailors would undoubtedly wish us to remember their brave American comrades today also. Together, we remember the sailors of both vessels, as well as those of other Allied warships, Australian, British, American, and Dutch sailors, who were lost in a series of engagements in the Java Sea while attempting to repel large Japanese invasion forces. We warmly welcome the family of leading seamen, Robert Malcolm Borwick, whose story will be told shortly. We are also honored to welcome Vice Admiral Michael Noonan, Chief of Navy. Mr. Les Cook, a Second World War veteran who spent three days on HMAS Perth I after evacuations from Crete in May 1941. And Mrs. Jan Chataway, widow of able seaman Frank Chataway, HMAS Perth I survivor and subsequent prisoner of war. We also warmly welcome Mr. John King, President, Returned and Services League of Australia, ACT branch, representatives of the HMAS Perth Naval National Association, representatives of the Naval Association of Australia, Ms. Rhonda Vanzella, National President of Australian War Widows Incorporated and member of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, and representatives from Canberra Girls Grammar School. We welcome the veterans who have served, those that are still serving, and the families that love and support them. We also acknowledge the members of the RSL and Services Club Association, RSL Victoria, and RSL Queensland, who are watching this ceremony broadcast across Australia. During this evening's ceremony, wreaths will be laid at the base of the Pool of Reflection by family and visitors to the memorial. 
Australia's Federation Guard is the tri-server ceremonial unit of the Australian Defence Force. They provide a ceremonial presence at civil and military events and during visits to Australia by foreign dignitaries. The Guard will now dismount the catafault party from the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. If you're able, please stand and join in singing the national anthem. If you're able, please be seated. The Australian War Memorial was the vision of Charles Bean, Australia's First World War official historian. Bean landed with the Australian troops on Gallipoli and stayed with them at the front through to the end of the war. The idea of this national memorial and museum came to him at Pozieres, France, 
in the depths of the bloody fighting of 1916. Bean's idea was that this would be a place where families and friends could mourn their loved ones buried in faraway places. It would also be a place that could help all Australians understand what these men and women had endured and what they had done for us. Bean's vision, to which we remain true, is best expressed as inscribed at the entrance to the memorial's galleries. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. Tonight, we'll read the story behind just one of those on the Roll of Honour, which lists the names of more than 102,000 men and women who have given their lives for us in war and on operations for more than a century. But first, we present a lament, Flowers of the Forest. Wreaths or floral tributes will now be laid at the base of the pool of reflection. Today we remember and pay tribute to leading seaman Robert Malcolm Borwick. Robert Borwick was born on the 21st of December 1910 in Fremantle, Western Australia, the son of Hugh and Margaret Falconer Borwick. 
Robert's father passed away in 1919 when Robert was still a boy and he was raised by his mother and elder siblings. On the 2nd of June 1928, at the age of 17, Robert enlisted in the Royal Australian Navy. He began a long career of service, starting at the naval base at HMAS Cerberus near Melbourne, and soon took a rating as an ordinary seaman in the newly commissioned Australian seaplane tender HMAS Albatross. In 1931, while serving in Albatross, Robert married his first wife, Edna Mabel Roots, in Granville, Sydney. They remained married until 1937. From 1928 until the beginning of the Second World War in 1939, Robert was promoted, eventually reaching the rank of leading seaman. His service history included periods in the heavy cruisers HMA ships Australia II and Canberra I, the destroyer HMAS Waterhen I, and the cruiser HMAS Adelaide I. In 1938, Robert married Jessie Maud Giddens in Sydney. In May 1939, Robert joined the modified Leander class light cruiser HMAS Perth. He was with Perth when the Second World War broke out and spent the first few months of the conflict conducting escort and patrol duties in the West Indies and Western Atlantic Ocean. While he was serving in the Atlantic Ocean, his wife Jessie gave birth to his daughter Kay in December 1939. He would not see his daughter until Perth docked in Sydney for a refit in March 1940. Just over a month later, Robert and Perth began escort and patrol duties off the Australian coast and escorted Allied troop convoys to the war in the Middle East and North Africa. In 1941, Perth served in the Mediterranean, where it assisted in the Battle of Matapan, the evacuation of Allied forces from Crete, and the Allied campaign against Vichy French forces in Syria. In mid-July 1941, Robert and Perth returned to Australia, and after a refit soon began to serve in the Pacific Theatre of the Second World War. On the 26th of February 1942, Perth sailed from Surabaya in modern-day Indonesia as part of the ABDA, a naval force comprised of American, British, Dutch and Australian ships tasked with preventing the spread of Japanese forces in the region. On the 27th of February, Perth took part in the disastrous Battle of the Java Sea in which five of the Allied ABDA ships were sunk. The survivors, Perth and the US ship Houston, were lucky to escape the Japanese attack and sailed to Java's north coast to refuel. The following day, they attempted to sail through the Sunda Strait on Java's west coast, but came across the main Japanese troop convoy in the region and again came under heavy shell and torpedo attack. At midnight on the night of the 28th of February and the 1st of March 1942, as Perth returned fire, he was struck by a shell that pierced its hull near the waterline. Not long after, Perth received several more shell hits and was struck by two torpedoes. The crew were ordered to abandon ship and Perth sank below the waves. In all, 357 of the 680 strong crew were killed in the fighting and subsequent sinking. Those that survived were taken as prisoners of war by the Japanese about one third of those men did not survive their captivity. The USS Houston suffered a similar fate. Leading seaman Robert Borwick was killed in action during the battle at sea. His body was not recovered from the wreckage. He was 35 years old, survived by his grieving wife and young daughter. Today, Robert is commemorated on the Plymouth Memorial in the United Kingdom which lists the names of over 16,000 Commonwealth Naval personnel of the Second World War who have no known grave. His name is listed on the Roll of Honour to my left, amongst almost 40,000 Australians who have died while serving in the Second World War. This is but one of the many stories of service and sacrifice told here at the Australian War Memorial. We now remember leading seaman Robert Malcolm Borwick, who gave his life for us for our freedoms and for the hope of a better world.
If you're able, please stand for the reading of the ode and the sounding of the last post. They know no grave but the cruel sea. No flowers lay at their head. A rusty hulk is their tombstone, a fast on the ocean bed. They shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We'll remember them. Got a bold party present. Um. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. We leave you this evening with the words of the memorial's founder, Charles Bean. Many a man lying out there at Pozier or in the low scrub of Gallipoli with his poor, tired senses, barely working through the fever of his brain, has thought in his last moments, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, that concludes the last post ceremony. We'd like to thank you for visiting the Australian War Memorial and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>